right, so I am Dylan Pistol. Uh, I talked to you on, uh, what was it, Monday, about the, uh, I did the intro to MR physics, and today I'm going to talk a little bit more about some specific pulse sequence developments that I've been working on here uh, for the last few years. Um, specifically, I'm going to talk about, as Andre alluded to, I'm going to talk about how we do motion corrected or motion compensated neuroimaging. So the basic idea here is that motion compensated or motion corrected sequences allow you to image subjects even if they move without discarding scans and rescan. Right? So the, the most common strategy that people have, if they have a, a wiggly subject who can't lay still for however long it takes to, to get a, you know, an MP rage volume, say the six minutes that you need in order to get a full head volume, is you throw it away and you scan again. And you hope that at least in the second six minutes the person will be still, or you do two of them and keep the best. Or, the goal here is to make it so that with one sequence in a single shot, you can get reliable data. Um, and <clears throat> there are many types of motion compensation strategies that have been developed over the years, obviously, because MRI scanning takes a while, especially compared to other modalities like CT. You know, motion has been a long-term problem in MRI. So lots of people have thought about this. I'm going to break these down into two very broad categories for the purposes of describing things here. One is retrospective motion compensation, the other is prospective motion compensation. So in retrospective uh, techniques, what we do is we post-process the data, the motion damage data. You know, so I, get, I do my six-minute scan, some of it's motion damage. I'm going to do post-processing on that motion damage data to try and estimate what I would have measured if the subject hadn't moved. Right? There's lots of methods for this that have got names like propeller, blade, snails, uh, things like this. Um, and, and basically what these techniques are doing um, is, is attempting a, a sort of a synthesis of the, the image you, you would have gotten. And, and invariably there's some trade-off there because you, know, you, you didn't actually acquire the right data. And so these sorts of approximations uh, you know, don't give you as good data as you would have had if, you, if the subject had been still. So the goal with prospective motion correction is that we track the subject and we change the acquisition on the fly to account for the subject motion. Um, so instead of trying to uh, fix bad data, the goal here is to get the right data in the first pass. Uh, and, but in order to do that, we have to modify the sequence dynamically. We have to respond to the subject moving actually in the scanner software. Um, there's lots of techniques that use this. Uh, some examples are PACE, um, which is a system for fMRI, VNAVs, which is the system that we've been developing here, uh, and PROMO, which is a similar system on uh, the GE platform. So I'm going to talk for the rest of this exclusively about prospective methods, because that's what I do and I'm primarily excited about. So Andre showed you a version of this slide. Uh, this is an MP rage of a healthy normal subject who was asked to change position every 45 seconds during a six-ish minute scan. Uh, so this is a nice normal MP rage. This subject did not thrash around in there, and these are relatively small motions. These were rotations of less than eight degrees uh, motions, translations smaller than 20 millimeters, so two centimeters of motion. So these are not big thrashing motions. Change position once every 45 seconds. If you just acquired the standard MP rage, you would get the image on the left. Obviously, that is not the image you want. Um, using our perspective motion correction system, tracking the same subject, we get the image on the right. So these were obviously two separate scans because, like I said, the sequence in order to do perspective correction has to be correcting on the fly. But this was a subject who was asked to repeat the same motions uh, and was prompted. So uh, I think this is a relatively uh, obvious example of why perspective motion correction techniques are important. Another one, uh, another interesting example, uh, and I show this data, um, and I, I want to be very clear that this stuff is not yet published. This is initial data from some pilot studies we're running, but I think it's a very powerful result, so I want to show it to you. Um, so what we're showing here is estimated cortical thickening or thinning, uh, comparing the same subject scanned back to back, so same healthy subject, scanned once with them lying still, scanned again, we asked them to move. Uh, and what this is over, I believe this shows five subjects, the average of five subjects. Uh, we've done this again with multiple different motions, multiple different sizes of motion, durations of motion. We've tried this a bunch of different ways, and the effect comes out about the same every time. What I want to point out here is that you're seeing 5% cortical thinning, 10% cortical thinning. 
cortical thinning, it's completely artifactual. Right? This is due to the fact that once there's motion damage in your data, it's very hard to accurately segment things. So if you have um, a disease or a disorder or whatever whose effect also correlates with motion, it becomes very hard to disentangle what you're seeing in MR. Are you seeing an effect of motion or are you seeing an effect, a, a change in physiology? Right? This is a, a really key point. Um, increasingly, there's more and more literature. I know Anastasia has talked about how this problem arises in diffusion. There's similar work showing it in functional connectivity. And what I want to point out is that, again, similar issues arise in morphometry. If you're really sensitive to whether motion is correlated with the, um, the other factors that you're looking at in your study, and just to point out, now we do no motion, and the person was moving, but we use our full motion correction system. And now you see that basically um, that we were able to reject a lot of that spurious thing here, right? We now get far higher quality data. We can segment it more accurately, and these problems seem to go away. So, having just showed you all the awesome reasons why you should use it, I'm going to say that everyone should. Everyone should be using motion corrected sequences if they're available on your platform. So our VNAV sequences are now available on Siemens scanners. Uh, I'm sorry to say not all of the Siemens scanners yet, but on many of the ones that are out there, you can actually just contact Siemens and ask for the works in progress package number 711, and they will give you our motion correcting sequence. Um, and they'll ask you to tell them whether or not you like it. Um, if you have a GE scanner, there is similar work going on under the name PROMO. Um, not exactly the same, but, but approximately similar methods. Um, if you have Philips scanners, I don't know of any work on this right now, but uh, it's an interesting thing. All right, so the overview of the remaining part of this, I'm going to talk about um, how we make this work. So the motion correction system that we have really consists of two parts. Uh, one of them is following the subject in real time, and the other one is retrospective reacquisition. Uh, and then the third part of this, I'm going to just talk for a little bit. I'm not normally a, a free surfer user. I'm an engineer who builds pulse sequences. Uh, but one of the sort of interesting things in doing in building these new pulse sequences was uh, that we use the FreeSurfer longitudinal and cross contrast tools in order to validate that our changes haven't uh, damaged the sequences. So I want to show you these sorts of non-standard uses maybe of the FreeSurfer tools because they're interesting when you're comparing pulse sequences. All right. So first of all, following the subject. So uh, this is a very simplified time diagram of what an MP rage or a T2 space sequence looks like. Basically, you have an inversion pulse. You wait around for a while while the tissues relax. Remember, remember I talked about inversion recovery, right? So this is an inversion recovery. There's my inversion pulse. I wait for the tissues to relax. That's the TI gap, the inversion time gap. And then I read out my data as fast as I can, and then I wait for everything to relax and do it again. So that's a very standard pulse sequence. Uh, other examples are things where the readout block causes a steady state and um, they need to relax out of that. So what we do is in all that dead time, we stick in an EPI-based navigator. So we can get a whole head volume in about 275 milliseconds. And then we uh, do, on the scanner, we do image registration and feedback our estimate of where the person's head has moved. That takes us about another 80 milliseconds to do the registration and feedback. So the combination of doing this every TR gives us updated imaging coordinates. We get a new image that tells us where the person is, we register, we feed it back, we change the imaging coordinates so that now our MP range is actually imaging in head coordinates wherever the person moves their head instead of stuck in standard coordinates or wherever you put them when you hit go. Uh, what does the navigator look like? So the navigator looks pretty crude, I have to admit. It's an 8mm isotropic whole head uh, EPI. Um, and one point I want to draw from this is that even though that's a very poor resolution, um, you can actually get far finer tracking accuracy. So people look at this and think, oh, okay, you can only track at 8 millimeters accuracy. Then. And we can talk about why. I'm not going to get into it. There, there's some elegant math that describes it, or I can give you the hand wavy version of it. Um, but both of them take a little bit of time. So if you want for right now, trust me, we can track it far finer than 8 millimeter resolution. Um, OK. And then I just want to talk about how this works over multiple TR. So this is one TR. But we know that the real MP range or T2 space sequences are made up of many, many, many repetitions of that pattern again and again and again. Um, and so you've got all these TRs in a row. What we do is we register each EPI navigator that we get. We register it back to the first one we got at the beginning of the sequence. So that way we're constantly imaging in the coordinates where we started at the beginning of the scan. And we register them back actually using Siemens's pace algorithm, which some of you are maybe familiar with, and it's used in fMRI. So at 3T, 
we have observed a variance of only 50 microns with a stationary subject a pineapple. Now, of course, I'm not going to promise that there isn't bias or other issues in this once the, once the subject is actually moving. Um, but we think that in real world examples, we, we can probably get better than 300 micron accuracy, um, which is pretty neat to be able to track that finally, and definitely enough to handle the one millimeter resolution that most people are imaging at right now. Uh, another nice use of this uh, is that it's, it's now rolled out to several hospitals, so clinically this is used at a bunch of sites around the US. Uh, this is Children's Hospital Boston, um, where they show an unsedated pediatric subject uh, scanned with and without uh, just to demonstrate the effect of it. So I, I think, I hope by this point you believe me that that part of this works, that we can track the subject, we can image in head coordinates and follow them. So now we're going to talk about the second part of this system, which is does um, automatic reacquisition. Uh, and this is the slide where you're all going to suddenly think that I've been lying to you about the fact that this works. So this is a T2 space scan where the subject uh, thrashed for the sec central 20 seconds. Uh, of, the, of the scan, right? Again, not huge motions, but continuous motion for 20 seconds. Um, and if we just did our motion correction, then we get the image on the left, which isn't awesome. And if we do our motion correction and we tell the sequence to automatically reacquire the parts of the scan that were motion damaged, then we get the image on the right. That's obviously a lot better. So I'm going to talk about why we do reacquisition as well, why motion tracking just isn't enough. Um, so as we said, we're registering right, in, during each TR, each TR is two to three seconds depending on the sequence you're running. You know, we take a navigator and we register it back to the first one. So the instant when, we're, when we have exactly right coordinate spaces or where I've drawn those yellow arrows, right, immediately after the navigators, that's when I've got my coordinates exactly right. But what if the person moves in all that huge gap in between? Well, I'm we don't see that motion during that time. We're blind to that motion. We can't correct it. We can only correct with a frequency of every two or three seconds. Um, and so that leaves us vulnerable to motion in there. So what we do is we uh, reacquire those motion damage TRs. We can detect that the person moved in there because they're in a different position when we reach the end of that block than they were when, when we were at the beginning. So that's a good sign that they moved in between. They're not in the same position when we reach the end of the gap. Uh, so what we do is on the scanner card, there's just a little box on the scanner user interface where you say, I want to remeasure this many TRs. And what that says is it adds that much time to the end of the scan. Uh, and by adding that time to the end of the scan, the sequence then automatically figures out which sections of the scan were damaged by motion and goes back and remeasures them. And if the subject was more still on the second pass through, then it keeps that version of the measurement and synthesizes one complete volume at the end. So this is sort of the, 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 perhaps you could say, the more intelligent form of the scan twice, throw one away strategy, right? Here what we're saying is, I'm going to scan for more time, but rather than synthesizing two garbage volumes, I'm going to take the best measurement of each part of K-space, and I'm going to synthesize one volume out of the best measurements that hopefully is less motion degraded than either volume would have been by itself. And of course, you don't have to reacquire complete volumes here. You can say, oh, I'm only willing to spend an extra 30 seconds on remeasuring because I don't have much time with this subject. Um, and the sequence will also now figure out um, when the subject has, uh, when, when there's no TRs that are motion damage left. So if you say, I'm willing to rescan for five minutes, but the person didn't move, didn't thrash for five minutes, then the scan won't waste time going through the full five minutes. It'll just stop um, when it's got everything covered. So I want to show you um, a nice example here. This is a uh, I believe this was a four and a half minute MP rage. It was, it was aggressively accelerated. Um, and the subject moved continuously for the central third of this scan. So there was a, more than a minute of motion here during the scan. Um, and as you can see, even with motion correction on, but no reacquisition yet, you get a pretty garbage scan, right? I mean, if we didn't have motion tracking on, this would be way worse, but this is still not usable, right? If your subject thrashes for a third of the scan. But because we can detect that react those, that motion, this scan, we went back and reacquired all the motion damage parts. So what I'm going to show you here is a little movie where we gradually add back in the reacquired sections and resynthesize the image volume. So you can see how it improves with the time spent reacquiring. So essentially, each frame of this movie is going to be the equivalent of about five seconds of reacquisition. So as we go, we can see it figures out which parts of K-space were motion damaged. 
and starts fixing it up. And as we get to the end, you can see the artifacts clear up. Right? Now, of course, you wouldn't actually see that because it would just synthesize this final image for you. But it shows you the value of the reacquisition. If you had no reacquisition, you would have got where we started. Being willing to spend the time on reacquisition, you get this image at the end, even though the subject thrashed for a third of the scan. So that is the, the system that we've built. Now I just want to talk a little bit about how we use FreeSurfer to validate it. Um, there are we're sort of three non-standard FreeSurfer uses here. Uh, the first is that we use the longitudinal analysis stream, stream on same subject, same day, motion free scans without navigators, with navigators, and with navigators, um, but not doing motion correction. And the reason we're using longitudinal analysis for this uh, is because we're, we're looking for artificial changes induced in the same subject here. So we can order these as if they were time points and then use the unbiased parts of the longitudinal stream in order to, to uh, perform a comparison between these time points, um, which is really important. If we, if we used uh, a, a stream that was biased towards any one of those measurements, we might see artifactual changes that aren't really there. Uh, similarly, we then use the cross-contrast registration tools a bunch in order to validate whether our T2 motion correction system was working. So let's go through these just a little bit. Uh, the first one is this longitudinal stream that I was talking about. So what did we get? We got three scans for each subject, same day, same session. So we know there should be no actual changes in our subject's anatomy. Uh, unfortunately, they're all out of register. Two of them were done with the VNAVs. Uh, two of them were done without motion correction turned on. Um, and we're testing to see whether we've accidentally damaged the contrast, whether there's reproducibility uh, across all of these scans. So the first thing is that the longitudinal stream uh, brings them into register, and then it builds a base synthesized out of all three of those scans. And then from that base, we build one segmentation. And then we can, now we have what we can sort of think of as voxel-wise equivalents here, right? We have one segmentation, we have a nice set of labels, and because all our individual scans are brought into register, not biasing towards any one of them, um, we can do comparisons inside of labeled regions. So we can say, how much does gray matter contrast, does gray matter intensity change when I turn on the navigators? How much does it change when I turn on the motion correction? How much do the estimated volumes of various structures change if I have the navigators? Excuse me, or don't. Ideally, I want no changes, right? I, these subjects were still, so I want you know, all of these to be the same, but I don't, the, the advantage of using the longitudinal tool stream is that I'm not biased towards any one of these, and so I don't get synthetic changes. Um, so I just want to point out that if you, if you are comparing different protocols or different sequences, this is a really nice methodology for robustly uh, comparing the, the, outcome, the outputs of those sequences, which is maybe nice if you're piloting studies. Um, so then we also did registration of same subject, same day, with motion T1 scans to a fully segmented same subject, same day, without motion T1 scan. Right, so here we want to see whether things get better when we're using the VNAV system and the subject is moving, but we've got a, a, a good baseline. Right? So to start off with, we use MRI robust template and we produce a segmentation from our known good scan. And now, because we can register them together using the robust template tool, um, we've got voxel-wise equivalents again, right? And we're not biased towards either of the, in the two motion cases, we're not biasing whether the, the with or without um, motion correction sequences, uh, we didn't form our segmentations from either of those, we didn't form our, reg our registrations from either of those. Um, and so by registering them back to, to the one known good scan, we get an unbiased voxel-wise equivalent. And the nice part here is that we can then extrapolate a segmentation to subsequent acquisitions, which is sort of a, a, a nice thing to be able to do when you're doing comparisons. And similarly, even more importantly, is when you have a different contrast. So for example, in T2 scans. Uh, so again, we had both with motion T2 scans, with and without the motion correction, and we had a known good T1 scan. So here we take our known good T1 scan, we produce the segmentation using the standard cross-sectional stream, and now we use the BB register tool, which brings those T2 scans into register with the T1. Right? And then, again, now we've got voxel-wise equivalents, we can populate that segmentation, those labels, 
back onto the T2 scans, even though FreeSurfer can't natively segment the T2 scan. We, using BB register, we can bring it into a space where we can populate those labels onto the T2, and now we can look and see whether um, there were changes in tissue intensity, things like that, whether the labels are consistent. So again, BB register allows us to extrapolate a segmentation to a subsequent acquisition with a different contrast. All right, and then lots of people have helped build this uh, system over the time that we've been working on it, so I just wanted to acknowledge their help and the funding that went into it. All right. Any questions? Yeah. So, a couple of questions. You said that you can track better than eight millimeters. Yes. Do you want to just elaborate on how much better the tracking actually is? So, we've done, so I, I'm not showing the results here. Uh, we've done some particularly funny sounding scans where we did uh, 390 micron scans that required the subject to be in the scanner for about a little more than three hours. Um, and you can imagine no one is staying still at 390 microns for three hours. So in order to keep averaging for that long, we used the motion correction system here built into the MP-Rage. Um, and that allowed us to get, I think, very good looking 390 micron data um, from a three hour scan. So I would say that if we had a significant amount of noise in the motion tracking, we would not have been getting, um, you know, accurate measurements at 390 microns. It's a hard thing because we don't have, for me to, to give you a, a strict figure of merit for this, because we don't have a gold standard tracker at this point. Um, you know, the, every tracking system has potential to introduce bias or error, so we can, you know, cross compare our system against someone else's, but it's hard to do ground truth on how someone is moving in the scanner. So instead, you know, the reason I give you that, that example um, is because I feel like it's a, a practical use case. So if it works, it speaks to the fact that we're tracking at a resolution where, you know, where you can image at 390 microns if you've got a subject who's willing to stay in there all day, sort of thing, you know. So because we're, we have lots of examples of it working at one mil, I'm confident that we're registering well below one mil accuracy. Yes, this works with, with any head coil. And for the actual um, the time that you're collecting, what's the minimum and maximum that you can give? Like, do you literally need every 10 minutes requiring, or is there a cutoff? Uh, so right now you can dial in, I believe on the sequence that we're distributing, you can dial in reacquisition for as long as you want. So if you really wanted, you know, if you, had, if, if you just absolutely needed a morphometry scan and you had really non-compliant subject, I guess you could dial it into something really long and hope that in that huge window you'll eventually piece together a useful case-based volume. Um, probably at some point, you know, I, I haven't tested the outer limits of it, probably you can dial in something that will run out of memory and crash, but I haven't, you know, I suspect that's, you know, 30, 40 minutes of scanning in, I haven't actually played with any sort of protocols like that because we don't have any users that, that normally want that sort of thing. Yeah. I'm curious if this would work or if you're aware of anything for elderly populations of a periodic tremor. So it's an interesting point. So people who just absolutely move continuously and are never still, this is not an ideal system for, right? So if someone's tremor is continuous and you know then then we'll see that every TR they've moved and we'll update to wherever they are at the beginning of the TR and we'll flag them all for reacquisition. You know, and maybe some of them will be better than others. Um, but really, at that point, you need a system with an update frequency um, that is closer to on the order of, of the actual tremor motion. Um, and where we have um, an external tracker system that we're working on here that Paul White and Andre are, are working on um, that actually uses an external tracker that you affix to the subject. Um, and it has a, a very fast update frequency. What are, what are you guys at, Paul? Like 10 milliseconds? Faster? Yeah, 10 milliseconds, something like that, that you can get an update every 10-ish milliseconds. So at, at that point, you know, hopefully they're not oscillating with such tremendous frequency that 10 milliseconds is, isn't enough. Um, so there's that. There's some camera-based systems that have very fast update frequencies as well. I, I would tend to guess that for populations with a continuous motion, those are going to be the ones that actually end up working better. So a similar question, the opposite end, I guess, uh, for patients who have ticks, uh, who 
might be still for some period of time and then have a, a larger amplitude of intermittent movement, is there, a, is there a large size above which the motion correction can keep up? Yeah, so unfortunately right now it's not actually a limitation of the algorithm, but a limitation of the safety protocols that Siemens established when they have motion correction systems on the scanner. Um, and, you know, we've talked to them and they can't even tell us why anymore. But someone once upon a time flagged that eight degrees of rotation and two centimeters of motion was the other tolerable limit. Um, and that's per update, which makes it even stranger. Um, because you know the person can pull an exorcist in there as long as they're turning very slowly, it's fine, right? It's just eight degrees per TR. Um, so yeah, it's a funny metric, but that's that's what we're stuck with right now because that is the official safety standard, um, and hopefully at some point that limit will get will get opened up. 